And I, I think almost everybody online knows who we are, the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director. We also see on screen Tess Galen, our events coordinator and office administrator who keeps everything running smoothly, especially for our programs. And our guest tonight, Grace Ongyan, and I, I look forward to introducing her in a moment. As you all know, the Athenaeum is a historic library and special collection specializing in Philadelphia art, architects and architecture, um, and, and a forum for community dialogue and conversation about all things Philadelphia and built environment, about history and literature. If you are new to the Athenaeum and you like tonight's program and want to learn more, we invite you to contact us, to sign up for more programs, to come and visit us. We'd love to have you join our membership. If you are trying to remember how Zoom works, if you are on a laptop or computer, you should see in your upper right hand side speaker view or gallery view. If you want to just be able to see our speaker tonight, while she is talking and her screen, uh, click on speaker view and that should give you a nice view. At the bottom of the screen, you will see Q&A. If you have any questions anytime, please feel free to type them into the Q&A and I will moderate those during our Q&A time. Our chat section is for, you can put comments in there too, usually giving out shout outs to our speaker, um, which is uh, much appreciated. We invite people not to create conversations among themselves on the chat during the talk as that uh, ends up being a little disruptive for everybody else. It's kind of like talking in class. So we're so pleased that you all are here tonight. And I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Grace Ong Yan, who is an assistant professor in the College of Architecture and the Built Environment at Thomas Jefferson University in East Falls. As an architectural historian, educator, and architect, her scholarship explores alternate theories of modernism, intersections of media and the built environment, and interdisciplinary collaborations. She's the author of Architect, the Pritzker Prize Laureates in Their Own Words, first and second editions, and she's also contributed to Companion to the History of Architecture, Volume 4, 20th Century Architecture, so you kind of see where her specialties lie, and the journal Design and Culture. She earned her B in Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin, her a master's in architecture at Yale and her PhD in architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I invite you all to join me in a virtual welcome, to Professor Ong Yang. Welcome. Thank you, Beth, for that generous introduction. Thanks for inviting me to come give a talk on my book. Um, okay, so thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so this this book came about as it was um, in one form, my dissertation from the University of Pennsylvania under the supervision of David Brownlee and David Leatherbarrow. But it also came, the seed for the idea came from my own experience as a practicing architect in New York City, designing brand identities in architecture and interior design in the late 90s. Um, oh wait. Okay. Um, this is a project that I worked on um, at Gensler Studio. 585, the branding studio. Um, now, unfortunately, Toys R Us has gone bankrupt, but this was um, their flagship store in Times Square. Um, so branding design kind of turned my world upside down as a designer in a good way. I had worked for some heavy hitters in the field early in my career, Renzo Piano Building Workshop, IM Pays, Paycock Freedom Partners, Raphael Vignoli and Bob Stern, all highly coveted design studios um, to practice in. And while I definitely learned some important ideas and skills, it wasn't until I worked at Gensler in the branding studio that I felt the spark for practice. Um, I think it was the signature mod architect model or star architect model um, in the prior firms where all the employees at these firms basically designed like the principal, um, the star architect. And branding was really the inverse of that. It was a total lack of the star architect and the design was towards um, identifying the client institution. Um, so I saw design as a true service and also an opportunity for design to influence the business clients. So bringing this into the scholarship um, um, of history, um, I was looking at architecture and design and business um, and kind of, and really jumping into the archival materials, um, no one had really written about branding historically. Um, there was a lot about 
corporate modernism in architectural literature and a lot about marketing and advertising in business histories, but nothing about the hybrid form of the two. So I saw that as a, as a real opportunity. Um, and I came at it with this question of how do clients think of their building projects? Do they think of them as merely real estate, places to house employees? Was there anything beyond that? Um, do they care about the design? If so, how? And do they consider the design as expressing their institutions and their brand? Um, so I was looking at how clients shaped or were involved in their architectural commissions beyond just being um, you know, the sort of purse for the project. Um, and in particular with the archival work, I jumped into the business archives. I mean, I did also uh, visit the architects archives as they were available, but really digging into the business archives to see, to gain new insights from the client's point of view on the architectural project. So looking at um, uh, meeting minute notes, um, memos, um, employee magazines, um, letters between the architects and, and the clients were really um, were fascinating and gave lots of texture and nuance to this, um, to the client and the story of corporate modernism. So the case studies, you know, so here is this picture of Frank Lloyd Wright with Herbert F. Johnson, his client with the S.C. Johnson building. Um, and lots of interesting exchanges between the two of them. Uh, I'm just gonna show you. So the, the case studies, the PSF, so um, there are P the PSFS building, J Johnson Wax building in Racine, Wisconsin, Lever House in Manhattan, and the Roman Haas headquarters on Independence Mall here in Philadelphia. So how I chose these case studies, um, I did choose um, consecutively, I wanted to give a historical evolution of the changes that are happening from the late 20s to the early 60s. Um, so picking a building in each decade was important. And also picking not one particular building type, but a diverse mix of building types. So I started with the skyscraper, um, and then there are sort of lower buildings of different um, shapes and sizes, kind of showing that heterogeneous mix of the kind of buildings that serve for corporate headquarters. Um, not being any one sort of building type. Um, and I also chose buildings in urban sites. Um, I'm interested in the density of cities that activates architecture as a kind of media uh, to be seen and experienced um, in that kind of density. Um, so historically, the, um, it also it was the perfect storm of the three disciplines of business, uh, media and architecture. Uh, between the 20s and the 60s, um, we saw the rise of corporations, um, also the rise of mass media and advertising and the modern architecture really blooming in America at the time. And also the question of why modern architecture and why corporate modernism. Um, you know, my field is modern architecture and, and being really fascinated by the ethos of providing good design and ethics um, to the masses through modern design was important. And I think corporate modernism in particular kind of has a negative image as these rational slabs and blocks and imposing um, in human buildings. And a kind of giving a new view to corporate modernism through branding. And um, that uh, by interpreting them as brands, it would give corporate modernism a new interpretation interpretation as more humanistic. Um, brands are designed to reach out to audiences, they communicate a certain aura, and they offer emotional con connection. So this is all uh, you know, in contrast to the sort of um, cold slab that was a source of social alienation, this kind of narrative of corporate modernism um, given by like Nathan Scully and Lewis Mumford, as well as other critics at the time. So the idea of the book is let's think about corporate modernism as a communication medium for the companies that they represent. Um, so each of the case studies, they're divided by chapter um, and they what emerged was a strategy or one main strategy that emerged from each um, case study. And they were signed for the PSFS building fame, the architect's fame for SC Johnson for the Johnson Wax building, form for Lever House, 
and material um, for the Roman house building. So each is the overt branding, brand building device um, with branding being accessible to all, like no prior architectural history knowledge is needed to understand um, these, these devices. So for the sign, we see the alphabetic expression, uh, the initials of the, of the institution as the most direct way to communicate with an audience. With the fame of the architect um, and his distinctive design, it really heightened the company's identity. Um, with the form, it was a memorable architectural form so that basically the building didn't need a sign and that the striking form served as the um, sign in essence. Um, and with material with Roman Haas, um, their product, which was plexiglass, was integrated as building components to make the headquarters essentially a de facto showroom for plexiglass. So these branding strategies were mediums of expression, um, the thing that allowed an audience to connect with the company. So instead of interpreting these buildings as imposing mute facades, um, the traditional narrative of corporate modernism, I'm showing how these buildings are accessible through their brand devices. So I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about some of my findings with each of these case studies. Um, so for the PSFS building, that was the earliest case study. Um, it's a famous building, especially here in Philadelphia that we all know and love. And I offer new insights on it. Um, one of the, and here's the sign on the roof of the building. Um, one of the um, ads that I found in the archives was this news, oops, sorry, this news, um, news magazine um, article, sort of with the with the byline of the most modern is the oldest, and building this modern building, and even today looking at the PSFS building in its urban context, it is strikingly different. Um, and when it was built in 1932, it was shockingly modern, and this was the epitome of a competitive business strategy, a design that stands out from its neighbors. Um, so certainly showmanship and advertising value were in the minds of the architects, George Howe and William Lascaz, as they struggled themselves and with their client to achieve a modern expression. Um, that struggle became very distinct architecturally, not with the typical international style expression that this building is um, usually accredited, but instead an exuberant showing, showy expressionism, which in the end generated great publicity. So this rendering by William Lascaz shows this almost Hollywood-esque um, view of the base of the building at night, um, very dramatic uh, with heavy contrasts. And really, you know, that advertising value was very evident um, in the way the building was rendered. Um, so the neon rooftop sign with the client's initials is this very overt um, branding device and interestingly, the modern expression of the building began with the question of electrically lit signage. Um, on the left is, so George Howe with his former partners, um, Arthur Me Walter Miller and Arthur Meigs designed a branch bank, two, two branch banks. This is one of them. And it was, as you see, very um, a very clean neoclassical design. Um, and after the building was already completed, his client, uh, John Wilcox, who was the president of PSFS, at the time requested electrifying the sign. So we see these metal cages sort of above the sign, giving um, light to the sign. Um, so Wilcox was really um, aware of the importance of signs and, the vis and visibility in this age of advertising in the early 30s. And at first, Hal refused the request. Um, the addition of a metal cage he thought would spoil his clean bank box. Um, but the client insisted and how relented. And it's an important point of tension that we, we see between the client and the architect. And ultimately um, later, he, he kind of uh, credited his client with pushing him towards thinking about something as um, technologically advanced as electrical lighting. Um, because, well, so how was trained as a Beaux-Arts um, architect, uh, but he was really trying to branch out towards modern design. And with his partnership with William Scaz from Switzerland, um, he was they were able to achieve um, the modern expression of the skyscraper in 1932. So he he really how really thought of designing the skyscraper around 
a sign. And the sign was the thing that really pushed him towards modernity in a way that he um, had not yet designed at that point in his career. Another interesting aspect um, from my research was um, how the architects carefully considered the sign, um, its typography and how it integrated with the building massing. Um, so at the time, um, Helen Lascaz really wanted their building to be a total work of art. They wanted the furniture, um, all the, and they did ultimately design all of these accessories and furniture for the building. And interestingly, I found a letter between Lascaz and the Bauhaus. He was trying to get furniture from the Bauhaus catalog. And of course, um, the Bauhaus had not had, did not have his business plan sort of together enough to actually produce those um, catalogs and will produce the furniture for Lascaz. So Lascaz and Howley designed all the furniture. And so in this sketch with the sign, we see them looking at the sign um, in different positions on the side of the building, on that blank um, south facade, and then they're trying it above the building. And they're also trying it like the whole name written out. Um, so here we don't see the initials yet. And that was also a point of um, tension between the clients and the architect. The architects wanted the wanted to display the initials because they saw it as a as a modern sort of uh, expression, right? The, the speed of modern life, people are using cars and trains at the time, they, you know, they're not walking. Um, we should give them the kind of billboard kind of initials, the quick sort of reading. Um, whereas the client was afraid people wouldn't know what PSFS was because at the time people didn't refer to it in that way and they wanted the whole name written out. They wanted their identity to be very clear, but that would make the letters really small. And they ended up having this meeting. They rented a hotel room a few miles away and hoisted up a full scale mock up of a letter at the initial size um, and then a size, the size of written out very small. And they saw that, of course, the, the large letter was much more legible from far away, thus giving them more advertising um, visibility. So they went with the, with the initials. Um, and so here's a drawing of the neon sign. Um, and this view is really important. This is a view of the PSFS building from the Delaware River Bridge crossing into New Jersey. Um, and I did some research finding out that they did, um, the sign at its angle on the building is squarely faced at the bridge. So commuters coming into Philadelphia from New Jersey would see the sign basically pointed at them um, from the Ben Franklin Bridge. So really important. Um, photograph that I found at the Hadley archives. Um, the next case study on fame um, and our, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, so SC Johnson is the company that still exists with the, the home cleaning products. Um, and Herbert F. Johnson was the, uh, it was a very family-based company, but Herbert F. Johnson was the president at the time and saw Wright's fame as a renowned architect and his unique modernism as a kind of spokesmanship for his company. Um, he knew Frank Lloyd Wright, a Frank Lloyd Wright design would get media attention that would help the company. And in fact, the company saw hiring Frank Lloyd Wright as analogous to their media sponsor, sponsorship of radio shows like Fibber, McGee and Molly in the 1940s and 50s. So this reinforced architecture as a kind of media and the client really seeing it as a kind of media similar to radio and television at the time. Um, and here is Frank Lloyd Wright standing in the Johnson Wax building in around 1950. Um, and brochures, this is a company brochure that features the, the famous dendroform columns. Um, you know, I think Wright's design and um, Brandy is just like the perfect fit because the way he designed was very innovative, right? And also really took to sound bites and even things that he said were really took so easily to sound bites and superlatives. Um, which really led into advertising and, and marketing. Um, and he really was this early version of the more recent star architect phenomena and how hiring a famous architect can help the institution with their visibility and ultimately their business. So here we see even in their um, brochure how the, the mushroom columns have become stylized and really become this image that is put forth um, as advertised for the company. And they're even pointing out Frank Lloyd Wright as the architect um, of their home base. Um, and articles, um, when the building came out, there was you know, quite the media frenzy when the building was built. 
and even the way these these articles are written, Frank Lloyd Wright designs the office of the future. New Frank Lloyd Wright office building shows the shape of things to come. That he himself was um, a big part of their their branding strategy. Um, and again, the innovative nature of his design. He um, innovated with the clear story windows, with corning glass, uh, the test tubes, creating clear stories. And Corning took advantage of that with an ad for their own um, material, um, this byline, the windows go around and around, right? It was this windowless office and this continuous window. So it, you know, the, the thing I mentioned before about his, his work being so easy to um, put into ads, like they were very um, sort of fantastic and and got a lot of attention just for being different. Um, and this on the right is um, the headline for the Milwaukee Sentinel when the building opened, fair atmosphere as Wright building opens and these people line up all around the building just to come in and see the new Frank Lloyd Wright design in their city. Um, another brand new strategy was is form, which I explored through Lever House in Manhattan. Um, and here it is on Park Avenue. Um, and it's striking form, you know, turning that slab um, perpendicular to Park Avenue made this kind of hole in the urban expression. And that is, in itself was really striking and different. Um, and also that expensive real estate being sort of not used up to its maximum capacity was a major, major um, statement. Um, the client happened to be Charles Luckman, who was trained as an architect and was on this hiatus from architecture at the time and worked for Unilever, the Lever Brothers at the time. He would later then of course go on to practice architecture again. But interestingly, having a client who was an architect, trained as an architect and become a businessman. Um, so, so this British soap company, Lever Brothers, so soap was this business that was very much about marketing and advertising. Sunlight soap was a solid product, but it wasn't anything innovative as, as soap goes. So the company really had to compete with other soap through advertising. And what made Sunlight unique was not the soap itself, but its trademark and packaging. Um, so we see, here we see an early ad for Lever Brothers and the 1950s ad, but they're both um, in, the, in the words of um, the advertising historian Roland Marchand, um, used this thing called scare copy, um, kind of triggering emotional securities of people to buy their product, right? On the left, we, they're sort of talking about why a woman looks older than a man, making someone feel really insecure and the sort of socially constructed body odor, you know, the fear of having BO would like um, motivate someone to buy the soap. And they interestingly use the strategy with their architecture, this really was analogous in their um, architectural project. Um, and they saw architecture as an influencer, just like the ads. So in their early days, since the early days in the late 19th century, Lever Brothers used architecture to cultivate its image with the nostalgic company Townport Sunlight um, in the 1880s. So at the time, um, with industrialization really taking over cities and becoming making the cities uh, polluted and unpleasant places to live, the opposite of it, the garden village, the self-consciously rural image and alternative to that urban industrial town um, was offered as a company town for um, lever employees. So they used this nostalgic image of architecture, arts and crafts, cottages, Tudor and Elizabethan buildings, um, a deliberately nostalgic image of the pre-industrial village, um, kind of right next to their uh, plant there. But you see that bucolic kind of um, atmosphere. So the same idea of architectural branding applied to the American headquarters, uh, branding through striking architectural form that would appeal to audiences as progressive, interesting, and unique. So on one hand, you know, it was the arts and crafts colleges, but here it is the um, modern um, form that's sort of serving the same purpose. So at the time, the then young firm of Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill having never done an office building for it, was hired by Lever Brothers to design their new American headquarters in Manhattan. They were moving it from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Manhattan. Um, and Gordon Bunshaft was, was the designer of the project. But interestingly, the 
building concept began as a speculative proposal for what they called tomorrow's office building. So Nathaniel Owens, um, the SOM partner, was a self-professed huckster. He was kind of a more businessy um, architect partner for, of the firm, presented this modern office lab there you see on the left at uh, building managers conferences um, at the time. So Nat Owens was a showman. He sold this office prototype and he urged business owners to buck the trend and move, of moving their offices to the suburbs, which was really popular at the time. And he pro proclaimed that offices didn't need to be dark, grim, dismal canyons of stone. And instead, tomorrow's office building offered advertising value with its striking modern design and desirable amenities for employees including plenty of daylight, air conditioning with sealed windows and outdoor and green roof spaces and parking. So the principles of modernism were packaged and pretty much co-opted into this one size fits all approach that appealed to business. Um, and cleverly, you know, this architect speaks the language of business in order to, to sell his speculative design. Um, so what began as a speculative, rather generic office building evolved into a quintessential example of corporate modernism on Park Avenue. So Lever Brothers was at first perplexed by the forward looking architecture that was unveiled to them. But ultimately the company was very happy with the building. Um, so we'll see like how this building, the top slab became turned 90 degrees um, for Unilever. Um, So um, J.E. Drew, who was the Lever Brothers head of public relations, boasted that everyone knows of Lever House because of the distinctiveness of its design. And he also um, said that it was worth $4 million of free advertising. So in effect that they didn't really need to advertise because the building itself advertised for them. Um, and he also pointed out that they didn't need a sign, right? That the building form really served as a sign um, and was striking in that way. And so this ad, they, they put this ad out in the New York Times when the building was completed, that blue green glass building at Lever House sort of perking the interest of people. Um, and then a few months later, Gimbel's department store puts this ad out. So <laughs> kind of showing that the building had made a splash and they could kind of give this alternative, oh, well, well now we can sell curtains because it's a glass building, <laughs> kind of this interesting kind of humorous take on that sort of publicity of Lever Brothers. Um, and with the Roman House building on Independence Mall, um, my research kind of pointed to material as that branding device. Um, so yeah, it was, it was also very enjoyable to do research on a building that is, I think, one of the most overlooked buildings of architectural history, um, that it had to do with material display and ultimately the integration of architecture and branding. Um, so by this point in the late 50s and early 60s, um, corporate identity um, and branding actually became, you know, something, actual uh, disciplines. And that integration, um, basically the materials and the architecture became sort of blended in this case study. So plexiglass is the invention of Roman Haas, um, this chemical company. And it had been holding its own as a substitutive material for glass since the 1930s. Um, sales of plexiglass really went through the roof during World War II. Uh, the government used it as a very effective substitute for glass on these plain um, windshields. Um, it was safe, um, just as clear as glass and lighter. Um, but when the war ended, they needed new markets for their company, I mean, for their product. Um, and so they look towards the building and design market markets with architects and designers. So their headquarters becomes an opportunity to showcase um, their, um, their company. Um, and at that time, the elder Haas was passed away and his son was taking over the company who ushered in a new attitude towards advertising and branding the business. They take this prominent site on independent small from they had previously been on Washington Square. Um, so the new site was part of the controversial urban renewal program. Um, and the George M. Ewing and Company um, architecture firm designs a building for them, but they are concerned that it's not, well, it's interesting, that building was actually kind of a vertical 
uh, building very different with how it turned out. Um, but they were, the company was really aware of advertising value and branding and they wanted basically a more famous architect to work on the project. So they found um, Pietro Belushi um, and he served as a consultant, as a design consultant for the project. And he had just moved from the Pacific Northwest to MIT to be the Dean there. Um, essentially, Belushi provided his own renown to the project um, and a higher level of design. And he had explicit directions from the client to be architecturally, in, architecturally innovative with plexiglass. Um, and the headquarters was dubbed the Plexiglass Palace by the media. Um, and it really was a kind of showcase for the product. Um, so here's the, um, so here are the three of them standing. So it's Pietro Belushi on the left, um, Haas, the president of the company in the center and Alexander Ewing, um, the son of George Ewing, who was the um, lead on this project in front of the Roman Haas building. And here on the right, we see the entry to their side of the building. Um, and through the glass, we see the famous uh, Yorgi Kepish um, plexiglass chandeliers. Oops, okay. um, so one of the, so there are these plexiglass louvers on the outside of the building that served as sunscreens. So an interesting sort of evolution of modern architecture, this glass block box needing um, sun mitigation, right? So they, Belushi designs these louvers brown louvers. Um, the color brown was actually meant to blend in more to the historic context. The clients actually wanted to use a bright blue plexiglass, which Belushi really nixed because he really thought that being diplomatic, right? The urban renewal project was so controversial. He wanted to bring like a good neighbor, right? To the historic area of Philadelphia and making it brown was a big um, part of that. He also compared it to the Seagram building. Uh, Mises Seagram building in New York because of the brown color. But so plexiglass literally being displayed on the outside of the building um, as architectural branding. Um, and the Kepish, so Kepish was also teaching at MIT at the time and a friend and colleague of Belushi and he asked them to design what Kepish called illumination design. So, you know, Kepish really thought of these as works of art. He designed 15 um, chandeliers for the interior um, lobbies of the building. Um, and here we see a photograph um, from the archives in the building of the building in the 60s. Um, so these, so on the interior, there were a number of artworks made out of plexiglass that the, build, the client commissioned. Um, one of them was this um, kind of architectural column that was designed by Mexican sculptor Arturo Cotera. He created this highly polished plexiglass and stainless steel piece um, for the boardroom foyer. Um, and there was also um, a mural by Shirley Tattersfield um, who created a colorful and dynamic plexiglass mural that placed at the entrances. One was at the entrance to the lounge and one to the entrance to the lunchroom um, for the, I wish these were in color, but they were very colorful. Um, with the one on the right being a lot of oranges and yellows, warm colors. Um, and finally, this, this last view, um, looking at Market Street with Roman Haas in the foreground and PSFS in the background, kind of frame um, the case studies uh, in the book. And so, so in conclusion, um, Architecture provides an experience of branding that is unmatched by traditional two-dimensional branding. So with modernism, the sense of space, materiality, the reality of place are incredibly persuasive to building occupants. Um, and it's very clever of these corporations in their understanding of architecture as branding. So my book offers a new perspective of corporate modernism through the lens of branding, which cultivates an accessible clear vocabulary for a broad audience. Um, instead of the modern narrative of rationality, I show these buildings as appealing to human emotion. So at the same time, I do see architectural branding as a cautionary tale that while architecture is a powerful tool, it must be calibrated to bring more than just the bottom line um, to the project. Uh, modernism's social aspiration was to elevate society through mass-produced good design 
And this was communicated through modern forms and ideals. And by commissioning modern architecture for their headquarters, these four business clients brought modernism to the masses and engaged them through their branding strategies. And thank you. Oh, I have this um, special offer, which I guess, I don't know about, should I leave it up here or go back yeah. and then, okay. Yeah, that's good to leave it up if you want, or you can take it down and put it up afterwards. Um, okay. Fantastic. Um, thank you. <laughs> we were getting some great, this is this is a great, great conversation. And, and I know I have questions going through my head too, and, and they're coming in. Anybody who has questions, please uh, uh, post them on the Q&A. Start with uh, Anthony about the Roman Haas plexiglass. He's wondering how much of sunscreening and louvers were not simply climate or sun control, but also essential to avoid the clouding or milky effects that plexiglass tends to get from exposure to the elements. That's an interesting question. Um, not simply. Do you mean that the coloring, like the brown color and the texture? I think that's maybe what what you mean. Would were sort of uh, the texture was give was put to the plexiglass to avoid the clouding, if it were clear. I think that might be just Wait, a sort of art. Anthony, if you you want, yeah, he says correct. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. I mean Belushi was it was interesting. He was chosen over because there were a lot of great architects in Philadelphia. Well, he wasn't even from Philadelphia, but there were, there were a lot of great architects that they could have chosen from um, in Philadelphia. And it's interesting because Alex Ewing, Ewing had you know his client's ear in who to choose for that. Um, but I guess I'm. I'm talking about this because I think Belushi was a pretty practical architect as well as being, you know, renowned and, and a good designer. Um, and so he may, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question, but he may well have thought of that um, being a very hands-on and, you know, he, his practice was, uh, had a sort of uh, more sensitive, right? Nuanced modernism in the Pacific Northwest. It was more humanistic. It wasn't just the, the white boxes. Um, so yeah, I think that's very possible. Um, but I was just gonna add that um, they did choose um, that consultant architect to be someone who kind of didn't have their heads in the clouds. There's this, there was this interesting conversation between Alec Ewing and, um, about not choosing a more like theoretical architect or an architect that was like had a practical uh, side to him was important. And that may have been the reason why like an architect like Mitchell Jurgula or even like Louis Kahn wasn't chosen because he actually, um, hmm. Alec Ewing was kind of a very practical architect. Like he, he kind of wasn't into uh, theories and big ideas. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, Jim is wondering if there was any sense of competition between Girard Bank with their new marble tower in 1930 and PSFS the same year. So can you remind me of the Girard Bank? Wait, where is that located? Um, Jim or anybody wants to put where the, the Girard Bank was located? Broad and Chestnut. Broad and Chestnut. Thank you, Anthony. I'm not sure about that, but I know that Art Deco Bank right across from City Hall uh, already had a second floor banking hall. So that so one of the innovative things about PSFS is that the banking hall was not on the ground, on the most accessible ground floor, but up on the second floor. And there was that the precedent of that um, national, um, I think it's called Market Street National Bank, something like that. But, but they did have a second floor banking hall, which was unusual and it was right there. So I think that that was a, direct influence of something um, in the neighborhood. But I don't know about Girard Bank, but I should look into that. It was Art Deco. So the Art Deco Bank was PNB. Oh, okay. okay. And Anthony corrects, it was actually South Penn Square, not Chestnut. Thank you both. It's a great thing when you get a whole bunch of people who all, you know, are are, are into this, you get crowdsourcing. Yeah. Get your answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Michael's wondering, uh, uh, there are some bad examples of architecture as branding <laughs> that you came across in your research. 
Well, I tr- you know, the thing that comes to mind with branding is like Disney, like Disney World, like the Rainforest Cafe, you know, stuff like that, which I, of course I try to avoid. I mean, they're definitely branding or, you know, and you can, I think, learn things from them, maybe in an abstract sense. But yeah, I was trying to point to, you know, good examples of architecture as brand that you wouldn't think so automatically, like the sort of Disney work. Which might get um, into uh, Dennis's question. Yeah. Um, he, so he's wondering if you investigated eccentricity or showmanship in branding. He said he's thinking of James Wine's firm site, SITE Architects for Best Stores, or was this more postmodern? Yeah. yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, actually, I, my next sort of research, I'm planning on researching best, actually, because when I did, well, so my original dissertation had a different fourth case study. It was actually a Minoru Yamazaki building for Reynolds Metals, but I changed it out based on peer review that it wasn't, that was, a, it was more of a regional headquarters and not a national one. So I changed it out with Roman Haas. But when I went to Virginia Historical Society, because Reynolds is based in, was based in Virginia, the best papers are actually at that same Virginia Historical Society. So it's actually my next site of research. That's really interesting that you brought that up. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this thing about showmanship was so interesting because I found in um, like a AIA uh, guidelines of the 50s that architects at that time were actually explicitly prohibited from advertising themselves. So hmm. there was a real like because architecture was a profession or trying to establish itself as a profession, you weren't supposed to like steal each other's clients and things like that, or even advertise yourself, which is so ironic because like, Frank Lloyd Wright basically stole that job from a local architect <laughs> who had already designed the whole uh, Johnson Wax building already in a neoclassical design, mm. but he basically just took it out from under him. <laughs> That's a great point. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Jim points out no advertising until the eighties. So that was, um... Um, Marjorie wonders if you know anything about the skyscraper that abuts the PSFS building immediately to its east, as she says, it seems to severely impede the architectural impact of the building and its sign. Is that a recent building? Let me see. This one that abuts. Oh, I mean, I, I know there's this, this new building right there and there's this really bright digital sign on it. Is that the one yeah. that Marjorie's talking about? Don't say really Marjorie. about that. Well, Marjorie, if you wanna say anything more and clarify, we'll move to um, uh, David's wondering if you found any evidence of these various players referring to branding efforts from, um, from so many of the earlier projects? Was there is that kind of building on this idea of, well, you know, S.C. E. Johnson branded and therefore we want to brand or? Um, well, I'm wondering if David means that branding didn't really exist as a thing until later and did the early earlier projects, um, were they doing branding? Is that the question, David? I mean, there was this kind of shift from sort of advertising um, and then sort of becoming branding later, like in the early 60s. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if it's but, uh, the, the, the sense that, um, and Marjorie was referring to the, the, the building that you can see in the PSFS photo um, that's kind of right behind it. Um, I think, so did did Roman Haas refer to any of those earlier buildings as saying, hey, look what they did. You know, we, we'd like to do the same thing. Like PSFS really exemplified their, you know, their, who they were in their building and we want to do the same thing. Oh, like did, did um, the PSFS influence Roman Haas, let's say. For example, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see evidence of that. Um, in the in the archives, but I mean certainly, you know, living in Philadelphia at that time, that 
it seems like it would be, yeah, something that they did notice and influence them. So Nicole notes that the building just to the west of PSFS is the 1234 market designed by John Bauer, designed specifically to the window proportions of PSFS. To the east is the, new, is the newer residential <laughs> building designed by Morris Ajmi. Um, <laughs> The curve of podium mini mimics plays off PSFS. In the photo, the dark mass attached to PSS PSFS is a part of PSFS. So there we go. We all crowdsourced. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, I understand. Yeah, that is dark. that's the spine. That dark. That's actually yeah. like when I showed those sign sketches, they were actually on that that dark kind of spine of the building. Yeah. Which is it because from far away it almost looks like it's a different separate building yeah. sort of yeah, yeah. onto With the radio it. Tower yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, your former professor David Brownlee wonders David if the Brownlee. plexiglass <laughs> lighting fixtures, murals, and sculpture in the Roman Haas building are still in place. And if not, do you know where they've gone? Well, the the lighting fixtures are still there, luckily. You know, um, as you probably know, that La Colombe is in there. <laughs> and the lighting fixtures there, but yeah, the mural. I don't know where those murals and the other art pieces. I know the there's one called Milkweed Pot. I didn't show because I didn't have a good photograph of it behind the building. Um, that's still there, but the interior ones. That's a really good question. I haven't really been able to. Unfortunately, the um, the papers. I yeah, I didn't find out as much about the interior as I would have liked. That's a great question, though. Yeah. So Stephen says he understands that you focus on modern architecture, and these are four great examples. But he's wondering how different is this period from earlier examples of a building intended to make a statement for a company? He's thinking, for example, of the Wanamaker building, not modern in one sense, but up to date in other ways for its time mm -hmm. and created to further Wanamaker's marketing and social ideas. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, one of the reasons why I chose the modern period is because there actually has been um, a good deal of literature on um, like the 19th century, um, the sort of historicist buildings and um, advertising and branding, like uh, Gail Fenske's The Woolworth Building book, right? Um, and a, a, a number of others. But yeah, I mean, it's a great example, um, the Wanamaker building of, of branding in the earlier period. So Richard um, is wondering if you've been able to look at the work of, for example, example Chair Mayaf mm -hmm. and Geismer, sorry, I'm probably butchering people's names here, such as for a mobile oil in, uh, in terms of, of clean modern design or the corporate program of IBM that mm -hmm. focused on clean modern design as a reflection of IBM's image as a high-tech company. Yeah, those are great examples. Um, there is a, a good book on IBM work by John Harwood. Um, it's called The Interface. Um, I can't remember the rest of the title, but it's about IBM's uh, constellation of modern designers who they hired under Elliot Noyes to design there. Um, yeah, and yeah, I thought about maybe working on um, Shermaya and Geisma. Uh, they have great, um, great branding work. Um, so, Jim is wondering you know, if corporations sort of echoed uh, as, as we moved post post World War II, the move to a development of the suburbs. Um, so wondering if the move to suburban campuses was was also part of branding as as time went on. Yeah, that's an interesting out of question. Um, yeah, that's another area of research. Um, there's also this, this great book by Louise Mazingo about the corporate campuses and branding. Um, it was, I guess it was just this move out to the suburbs in general. Um, and that's something I do touch on in the book and the conclusion about, you know, I talk about the contemporary situation of the, the, the big tech build um, companies having these corporate campuses and kind of, but, but there has been this sort of recent move back to the city but then still like, um, you know, Apple um, and Google are still out in the, in the, in the suburb. I mean, it's definitely, um, you don't get the density, right? In the suburbs of, and that visibility, it's more really that image and the image 
coming up in media uh, rather than actually experiencing that building that you know comes into the mind. And in some ways in our digital age, that may be even more powerful, like having the media image of that ring, right? Someone, I just saw the Apple headquarters, just being, you know, propagated in media everywhere. Like, I think everyone has seen that, <laughs> but no yeah. one's actually been there because <laughs> it's like in this far away, you know, no, one, you know, no one's been to Cupertino. Um, <laughs> so yeah, interesting question. Interesting. So uh, Jean, Jean Wolf shows that she, um, when the PSFS building was turned into a hotel, she had to do paint right. analysis to show that it had always been blue and the PSFS mm -hmm. initials and color had to remain to keep the integrity of the design. So she's wondering if there was a debate over the background color of the PSFS sign. I didn't, I didn't come across that, but that's really, that's really fascinating that, that you worked on that. Um, and I guess you find out the answer to that one. I'm here, Charlie Kruger. This is fun. So the the Longaberger Basket Company building in Newark, Ohio, <laughs> was built in the shape of a basket. How would you classify that? It sounds like something that might be in Learning from Las Vegas or something. <laughs> That's inventory, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. No, I, it's a really good point. It, it gets into the postmodern um, context. Which is which is what I'd like to work on next. Um, of you know the symbol right in the building as as a sign, mm. which a whole other can of worms, <laughs> but, but a really good point. I mean, it definitely is architecture as branding. And um, there's a question uh, about wondering if the Roman Haas building, if they're remembering correctly, sank at some time, causing a scandal. Um, I wonder, I don't know about that. Like literally sank like into the ground, like a sinkhole. Settle maybe, or? Settle. Um, there was a scandal about um, the chemical, people working in the chemical plant and that causing cancer. Um, that did come up in my research um, in the news media at the time. I didn't read it. I didn't find anything about it sinking. Well, Dennis notes that the Inland Steel Building in Chicago was mm. designed by SOM Bruce Graham and uses stainless steel mm. as a major design element in the facade, which seems yeah. derived from the Lever House. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, sometimes I think I could write, I could also do research and write a book on just the materials, because Reynolds Metals, um, the, the other research I did was aluminum was used, but uh, Minoru Yamasaki designed these beautiful aluminum screens, all, again, as a showcase of the material that the company, that was their product. Um, and also there's the P Pittsburgh plate glass by Philip Johnson, um, also is this building that displays the glass on, on the exterior of the building. But yeah, really good point about inland steel. And then we're talking about uh, design. So Anthony, uh says he thinks that an important difference to note between buildings like Wanamaker's and later ones like PSFS is that older ones may have used branding in a more sculptural and or functional sense, like in our arcades mm -hmm. or light wells or fountains. And later ones looks like actually incorporated company logos like PSFS or products like Roman Haas plexiglass in their design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I do think about like what's more spatial right because what you described as the earlier may have actually been more spatial because there's always this element of bringing in graphic design which is very flat right and not spatial but maybe those early ones were actually more spatial so when i think of like the woolworth building like that interior where you come in the lobby is like with all the the vaults and the beautiful materials and detailing i mean mm -hmm. it's so spatial right you can't it really like reinforces that it's architecture and not graphic design or yeah, something flat. Yeah. Oh yeah, Alcoa building. That's a good point. Yeah, a couple people have noticed that Alcoa yeah. building. Yeah. It's an aluminum. Um, so Steve asked if the PMB building designed in response to PSFS or similar approach with the sign on top. So did PSFS putting their big sign on top to kind of start a any you know, kind of a, a fad that other people wanted to to follow after them? 
it seems like that. I mean, this is my observation. I didn't find anything in the archives of that, but, but you know, I worked for Jefferson. I saw, you know, there's this giant Jefferson sign <laughs> right next to PSFS now. Um, yeah, I think definitely it spurred a, a trend. And Jay uh, noticed that in, in the chat that PSFS carried its branding strategy out in the branch system. Someone did mm -hmm. note that building radical glass boxes like in Roxborough while other banks were building faux colonials. Yeah, that's that's like an area of research that um, I think would be really interesting. Or the branch, the branch banks of PSFS are very understudied. Um, yeah, another possible <laughs> research project, but yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and that's also like the suburbs or yeah, the outside the, the urban center, which is another interesting question about density and branding. These are all such great questions. Thanks. Thanks for great audience, Beth. Great questions and great observations. And you know, what a Fred, what about the McDonald arches? <laughs> didn't, didn't they talk about that in the movie? I'm trying to remember what what the whole decision with the arches was. Um, well, what's interesting but, about I feel like the newer McDonald's, you know, have you noticed that they've been renovating all of their little drive through little um i think the arches are definitely de-emphasized now and it's more about you know it's almost this kind of interesting abstract form right this kind right. of like gray boxes that are kind of kind of cool <laughs> and i think the arch logo has be has really been de-emphasized which means they're kind of going for the form brandy device more than the sign yeah, because um, the sign tends to be more commercial, right? So it's sort of like the person who doesn't have any design background will just put up a sign, right? And that's the the Venturi I am a monument, right? Like it's a big sign, right? It's this kind of very fundamental way of approaching um, branding, um, and maybe McDonald's is trying to be more sophisticated with its form. Um, obviously, a designer, someone designed that, right? Um, that form. Well, this has been fascinating. I um, this is great. I've had so many good questions and observations and, and thoughts. Um, <laughs> oh, here, Anthony. Perhaps McD's M is victim of his own success. It became so commonplace and common that they almost de-emphasize it now. Um, there does seem to be a shift today in how how, um, how buildings are built and, and how people want their brands to be seen and designed yeah well i look forward yeah. to having you back again as you continue to do more research and and um explore some of these questions and and uh, come back with with some more stories this has been absolutely wonderful grace and if you want to put back up on the screen where people can buy your book um okay thank you thank you beth this was really a pleasure yes and this thanks was for the so wonderful so you get a, a discount um if you use code BB15 through LondonHumphreys.com. And if you forget that and you don't do it, Tess has, the, has that link. And we also have it on Bookshop on the Athenaeums Bookshop.org site. Um, and we have it in our library. So hope you'll, you'll pick it up and read it. And we can continue to have more conversations and look forward to having you back, Grace. This has just been wonderful. Um, hope everybody gives a shout out. Um, I think we all learned a lot and, and it's been really interesting. As Tess said, she isn't going to think of her bus stop the same way anymore, right outside Roman Haas. So this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth and Tess and everyone mm -hmm. for coming in. Your great questions. This was, it was a great audience. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a, a wonderful evening. Enjoy the slightly